Welcome everyone to our 12th session of the Library of Things collab. Uh, thanks for sticking with us throughout this journey. Um, we're going to be um, finishing up this this session and, and, and then we'll have a little bit of dialogue at the end about what's coming next. Um, and But before we get there, we're going to get to hear from Hazel Ansrud about uh, how to work with and within public libraries. Uh, this is something that I'm very excited about. And uh, as I mentioned previously, had tried to figure out a way to get the Asheville Tool Library to open or be partner with the, the public library system in, in Asheville years ago, and it never quite came together. But I just think there's so many amazing opportunities there. Um, after we have the after the session's over, um, we will have time for for Q and A. We'll also stick around a little lo longer today uh, for those who want to chat about what's coming next. Um, as always, this session is being recorded. We'll be posting it to Canvas, and you can access the the transcript, the video, um, and also the the, the chat record because these chats are so robust uh, and so much more robust than the chat that we've been able to have so far on Canvas. So um, if you want to go back and find find thing, interesting tidbits, links that you missed, um, you can find all that stuff um, as well on Canvas. Um, and if you have any questions as you go, feel free to either send a message on the regular chat or if you want to do a direct message to anybody on Shareable staff, you can find us identified by... Not the pizza in our mouth, but the pizza on our names. Um, and I think without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Hazel. And I'm going to jump in just one second and say that because we do record these and post them on YouTube, if you are uncomfortable with your name um, being posted on social media, you can just take it out. Uh, we want to protect your privacy. Thank you. What great words to start her uh, public library presentation with. <laughs> I have to say something similar when we do our events. Um, gosh, all right. Well, thank you all so much um, for having me here today. I am really honored. I uh, was a huge fan of Shareable and a lot of your folks work for years and years and years. So it's kind of exciting to be no, here really in the cool club. Um, so I, um, my name is Hazel and I'm just moving all these little accoutrements to the side so I can just pay attention to talking. Um, and I am now a public librarian. Um, I was not always so. Oh, um, and, uh, actually before that, um, I, so I have a few different lib identities. Um, the public library I work for is in the state of Maine, um, and I work right on the coast. We're a pretty small little library, but I'm going to go through a few of these identities, not because, um, there are things you need to know about me, but because I hope that they're going to be something that is really helpful for you to know about in the future. Um, but before I even start this presentation, I, I want to do a couple of things. Um, first, I want to let you know that I'm going to lie to you. <laughs> I don't mean to, but I'm going to, um, because I can't possibly tell you about every public library out there. It's just that would be impossible, especially when we're talking internationally, different cultures, different um, states, different so much. But what I, I'm tr going to try to do is point you so that you're used to some of the um, vocabulary and some of the concerns that I think are pretty um, standard across the libraries. And to do that, I think it's important that I do share some of my biases so that you know where I'm coming from, so that when I make a mistake and you uh, base something that you are working with off of the assumptions I tell you, you can be like, I'm blaming it on this person and their biases. <laughs> so, all right. So feel free to do so. No problem. Okay. So I actually came about this um, from the tool library perspective first. So I um, was on the team to start the main tool library um, uh, in the state of Maine back in 2013, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm no longer associated with them, although they're great. It's just uh, 
we birthed this on purpose, but I also had a surprise, always desired, always wanted real live birth at the same time. And when she was two, it got a little hectic, uh, you know, checking out equipment at the same time. So um, I retired from that, but then I um, went on to, um, but hopefully I'm going to share some lessons learned um, from this transition from moving from a tool library environment to the public library environment. So I now am an actual public librarian. Um, one of my grad degrees is in kind of um, information management and systems, which is how I was able to, to become a public librarian. And um, we're right on, on the coast of what's now known as Maine. Uh, in the United States. Um, we only serve about 25,000 humans. So again, uh, this is gonna be different than some of the urban libraries or the more even the more rural libraries we talk about. But it is a public library perspective rather than say an academic library or a private library. Although I do, I can talk to you about those too. So again, I also hope that if you're gonna take anything away from this presentation, please, other than that, I'm probably gonna lie to you. The second thing is, is that to please reach out to one, tell me how I lied <laughs> and two, for us to collaborate more together. I'm really excited to be um, in on this um, and work with you folks. And um, it's been some of the joys over the past few decades I've been in this field. Um, and I'm also an introvert. So if you kind of contact me and call me up and want to talk to me, I'll be like, oh my goodness, someone wants to talk to me. <laughs> so it'll be okay. Um, so uh, another bias I have, and I think it's really relevant to this presentation, there's a new initiative called the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. And I think that's really important for us to know about as tool librarians because it is it started in the US and it just expanded nationally to the US. So libraries are just joining it now. Um, I officially am on um, the advisory board uh, now um, and, and mentor libraries to do this, but the folks who are in this initiative and other folks are really excited about repair cafes, you know, uh, social equitable programming, libraries of things, okay? So sometimes it's, it's not going to be as hard of a lift. People aren't, if you're in the library world now, you're not saying, what is sustainability? You're not, you're not there, okay? It's, it's, this is a common, um, it's, it's in the common actually ALA values. Uh, another bias I have, um, again, I'm just going to keep rolling on those, is I like to share like you do. Um, but we recognize that unlike the amazing tool library listserv that exists, thank you. I, I've, I've been a member for many years and then I went away and then I came back recently. Um, that we didn't really have a great way to share um that information in a way that was really relevant to or in relevant in the same way to public libraries and some of the biases associated with public libraries. So we recently started a library of things mutual aid group for um, primarily targeted at public libraries. And so a lot of the stuff I do, I share, um, I, I've started working with other libraries and sharing with them. Um, I think if Gene's on the call, he came to the last meeting and I think he can attest pretty easily that, oh, we have some different different uh, you know, cataloging questions and things. There's some different biases there. Um, same with, I want to call it Rachel, uh, Rachel Tanner, if, if she's on the call, uh, she, she also had some great contributions to talking about how public libraries are a bit different. So there are some of us here um, who have kept in the, the loop on the tool library side of things, but have also had to learn to speak this public library language. So hopefully that is what I'm going to give you insights on today. Um, and if you want anything, any of the diagrams I show or whatnot, this is, if you go to curtislibrary.com library of things, that is the public library I work for now. And we try to share that information um, at the bottom of the page below our inventory. Um, and much like you folks now, we use my turn, so it looks similar. So this isn't going to be anything for you. The last thing I wanted to call out before I really get started into the, um, you know, uh, large part of this presentation is uh, an apology because I would so have been here every time, every Tuesday night, but this is where I actually am on Tuesday nights. These are some friends of mine. I am at the, what's called the help desk at the public library. And um, what you might know in your public library is something called a reference desk. Uh, but in many public libraries, we're actually rebranding it now to call it the help desk because that is what we actually do. Uh, and this is really important, especially in small rural libraries. You are typically in charge of the library if you're at the help desk, if you're the librarian. So which is kind of a great concept, right? 
Like it is your job to help people. Like that's it. Um, and, uh, and we, so it's, it's a, it's a version of ask us anything. So that is why I have not been here to listen to all of your presentations. That is my job at 4.30 on Tuesdays, not tonight, but normally. <laughs> Um, but I've hopefully watched you all afterwards. So please, please don't be strangers. Um, I'd love to chat with you more. Um, okay, let's get started. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the modern public library. I think I thought I knew what a modern public library was before I started working at one because I'm that level of geek. I like hang out there, appreciate it, share things. I didn't know. So I'm going to try to give you some of the insights I've learned. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this concept of lending everything and designing the ecosystem that you want in your community. Because again, what I, even I talk about today is not going to look the same in your community, right? We all have different priorities, needs, actors, et cetera. Uh, three, I am going to call out a few different approaches. Um, you'll notice there's only one of me on the call. <laughs> I was hoping, you know, to have a large posse of humans uh, who could call out these different approaches. Um, but I'm going to just call them out instead because they're doing great jobs where they are. You can call them up. Um, and there's some really great different um, ways to to work with and within and, um, you know, or even in tandem with, um, with goodwill uh, with, a, with a public library. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about a case study, and that will be the library I currently am at, because I think it's important to just talk about some of the minutia for a minute so that you realize what could be sticking points when you go to work on your own case study if you decide to kind of approach public libraries. And then um, lastly, I'm going to encourage you to do the two things that I wanted to start this presentation with, which is one, recognize I'm lying to you. Two, <laughs> please, please stay in touch. I really would love if I can be of assistance. If you need a public library perspective, I can try to get you someone in your community. Um, and I would love to do that. So um, I hope, and I hope you all come visit in person. Come on up to Maine or down to Maine or across, wherever you're from. Cool. So let's see. Public libraries, that's where we're gonna start. So the modern public library is a lot of different things. Um, and I want to do a little thought exercise with you all here. So you can close your eyes if you want to. But I want to imagine yourself in a public space that you know pretty well and that you've been to a lot of times and that you've seen some things in. A grocery store is a really good example. You can imagine the public library if you want. Um, but I would encourage you to think about like a grocery store or that public park or even a gas station some place where you see a lot of different humans. And I'd like you to think about what you see as you think about every trip you've been there and then what you've seen, how you've seen people treat others when they're waiting in line, how you've seen, you know, maybe a, a teenager translating for their family. Maybe you've seen some teenagers, you know, running down the aisles and having fun. Maybe you've seen some kids, uh, you know, goofing off. Maybe you've seen a few biohazards around, you know, maybe you've seen some really great examples of fantastic humans doing fantastic things um, and interacting with others well, or maybe you've seen some examples of humans having a really bad day. And maybe that bad day is really justified because like the system's against them. Um, the systems are against them. Um, and maybe you've seen like an amazing amount of, you know, someone slipped up the equivalent of someone slipping on a banana peel. And then this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. Um, then I want you to think about that and say, imagine if you worked in that environment every single day. That is your public library. <laughs> so whether big or small, it is full of wonderful, wonderful things. It is full of delight. We have to be a place that is open and free to all. And we pride ourselves on that. Um, and this is really important because it's one of the few, unlike some of those places I mentioned, where whether it be a gas station or a grocery store, where there's all different ages of people, where there's all different um, backgrounds, there's all different languages, there's all different like ways of interacting with the world. We've got neurodiversity, we've got diversity of all types, which is a wonderful thing. But as you can imagine, we're not all perfect all the time, right? Perfection, you know? <laughs> so, whoops. And that's okay, right? 
but your public library is one of the few spaces where we actually encourage people to come in, to be there, to interact with others, and to stay there without purchasing a thing. Okay? So that's a very different space than at least when I operated our tool library um, with our tool library team. Um, and maybe, you know, despite everything, despite all the similarities we have. I think a few things I want to call out is not a lot of places have public bathrooms anymore. We do. Um, it's not a place where you have to spend money, right? It's not a place where you can have like large collaborative parties. You can have work parties. You can have meetings, um, but you also need to have areas for silence. And please, other folks who know libraries well, you're welcome to like chat along on the thing, say yes, no, Hazel's wrong. <laughs> like totally call me out on it because as I said, I'm gonna lie to you a bit in this. But overall, I just wanna make sure that we all understand that the modern library is a community hub. And we're actually working actively towards that. It's not just something where we have, um, we don't just lend books. You know, every most libraries you go to is a space where you're, you know, meeting, whether it's for story time or you're lending um, online services. Sometimes you're lending craft classes. Sometimes you're lending DVDs. So a lot of folks, even if you don't officially have a library of things, which is, I would say, one of the more common brands. Sometimes it has unusual things to borrow. We call these things different. You still might, you're like, well, we don't have a library of things, but, you know, we lend a telescope, right? So sometimes there's that level of knowledge to it, too. Um, and the way the library cards work is a little different. I want to call that out. So sometimes you, if you, for example, in my town, if you, you have to pay taxes to belong, to, to have a library card with our library, or you have to purchase that library card. Um, or the entity that you're with, like say the um, the community center for people experiencing homelessness, that we allow they they have cards for folks experiencing homelessness and things like that. So there's kind of ways around it. But in other systems, um, you know, the library card setup works differently. But everyone, regardless of if you have a card or not, can use public computers, can get access. Um, uh, to our programs. So again, our programs have to be free and open to all. And we're coming back to that later because that's important, is an important difference uh, that I had to get used to. Okay. So this is really great because this means that as a collaborator for your stuff, they can bring so many good things. They can bring great humans, unique access to different types of groups. They can have, they have a, you know, decades worth of how to run programs, lending expertise. Oh man, talk to them about, if you have a stinky tool, they know all the ways to get rid of that. If you've got, if you, we've got dogs that search out bed bugs, you know, we, there's all sorts of things. <laughs> so they've got an amazing amount of wisdom biohazards. They really know they're biohazards. Um, not to mention all the other things. You can offer space with amazing publicity resources, easy registration. There's, reg there's, there's people who just work with, there's clients who work just with public library systems. You've got space and how that space can be um, recreated to meet the needs of different groups, how it can, we can go out to community members with different types of um, vehicles or, or lack thereof and, and meet people where they're at. Amazing community relationships with communities. People love, you know, donating or speaking for public libraries, coming to speak and donating their time and resources. Again, a lot of um, experience with multilingualism, multi-ages, multi, you know, co-op, different cooperation examples. Um, and just there are libraries that are lending humans, right? stories, lending different types. There's something called the human library. There are libraries that are lending, you know, um, recipes. There are libraries that are lending stories. And of course, there are libraries that are lending things, not to mention space, land, all the stuff. So they can be a really great collaborator. I also think it's really important to call out that the ALA, the American Library Association, has a bunch of core values. These are their, they actually just redid them like yesterday. <laughs> so they have now only five, but you can see this is where it came from. Um, sustainability will still be on there. There's a few that are still on there. The public good is still on there. They're trying to simplify them. Um, so this is out of date. So I told you I'm lying to you. Uh, but you can see that some of these, you could see, oh, well, these are in line with our tool library values. And I'm going to be quite frank. Some of them are going to cause you trouble working with libraries. Because the fact, for example, that I can't, we can't share our members with you. Right, we have to we have to also respect the confidentiality. We we do not track what our members take out. 
We happen to know who the last person was who checked out the item, but beyond that, we don't know. So sometimes this can, can cause an issue, and there's very, very good reasons for this. Um, again, I want to go back to a couple of things that I think are really important to call out for uh, uh, for working with public libraries. First off, um, and a lot of, including the tool library I was a part of, we charged, um, we had a sliding scale. So you didn't have to pay money to be part of the tool library, but we encouraged you to if, if you were able to. Um, and so we did have membership fees. In this case, if you take a class, there has to be no costs. We have to pay for everything as a public library. And different libraries get their funding in different ways. Some have an annual campaign that pays for programming. Others, their annual campaign pays for books. Others, their annual campaign pays for um, their staff salaries, right? So in other words, in some different ways, some libraries, um, they're owned, um, like in our library, the the salaries are paid by the municipal government, but we're not municipal employees. And the building is owned by the municipal government, but all the book funds are come from an annual fund. That is not true, a couple towns over. And if you go to different libraries around the different states, different countries, it's gonna be different each place. So sometimes the regional something has control over some things, and then other times it's the town, other times it's neither. And it's just a nonprofit, nonprofit. The other thing, again, we have to be open for the public. And you're probably thinking, well, of course, that makes sense. Aha, here's some trickiness. So for example, if we want to have a group, we had a, um, um, we had the Mid Coast Indigenous Awareness Group that we partnered with here at the public library to put on um, a number of book groups, which is great. So if you were interested in learning more about the original inhabitants of this land and those folks who are still here, you could join us and learn and, and great this great book group and learn all about um, a lot of different uh, issues that you might be interested in and a lot of different and had great speakers and everything. Later on, we wanted to sponsor a, um, a LGBTQ plus, uh, QA plus, QIA plus, Yes, I think that's what it was at the time, um, book group. But we actually had to not sponsor it because once we worked with the community to create that book group, they wanted to make sure that they didn't have to do a lot of code switching and chatting about. They wanted to make it so that it was only open to people who identified as such as within that book group. And so we had to make sure that uh, so they they needed to keep it um the membership uh, closed off to certain members of the public. Um, so they didn't have to code switch and things, which was fine, but again, not appropriate for the public library. So you could see that maybe, you know, if you, if we want, we couldn't do just, you know, certain groups of certain types, which I know in some of, in some, you know, uh, great places in our community that we are, they are able to do that. Um, we also have to have things that are suitable to the space. So your public library might um, have different spaces and sometimes those spaces have carpeting or sometimes those spaces they've had to say no to certain things because they have to be free and open to all, but they also have a building policy. So maybe it may be by sometimes opening up to certain activities, they actually open themselves up to other activities. <laughs> and it's not maybe your activity that's the problem, but maybe it's, for example, if you don't want, if there's a no food policy, it might not be you that are the problem, but it might be the fact that there are folks with severe allergies, or it might be the fact that every carpet has gotten ruined ever because they allowed birthday parties in there. And so things got squished into the floor. I don't know. I'm not making assumptions on that. I'm just saying that um, I've come across times as we've, I've worked here over the past seven years. Um, that it's been some really interesting things being like, oh, that's why that's not going to work, <laughs> you know, um, versus it really will work wonderfully in a different space. So I would encourage you whenever you run into these things at a library, try to dig in more to say why and be like, oh, so that way we could work around it when you when you work together. And then we have some quirky things that you may not know. Like I didn't realize that when you give gifts to certain public servants, they have to be under $10 US. Otherwise, they could count as a bribe. So, so like there's some things like that that sometimes development officers at a public library are aware of because we work so often with these um, with with saying thank you to so many different groups that there's some quirky situations like that. Okay. So 
in some, you might encounter some weird stats. So there's some things, more stuff you will encounter here. Uh, staff silos. If you get no from one person, don't necessarily take that as the end all be all. There are sometimes like uh, maybe the children's department would really like to work with you, even though, or the community engagement folks would really like to work with you, even though, you know, the adult programming folks are like, mm, not going to work for us. Sometimes in these organizations, there really are those staff silos. So don't forget to ask, oh, actually, what do you think I could get in contact with them just to see if we could get in on this angle? Um, we made that mistake at when we started the the main tool library, we only asked a couple people, we should have asked more. Um, another thing I've learned uh, is that there's a lot of different structures. So I already taught, counted on, talked about that before, but I would just really encourage you to ask those questions about that because that could give you ways in and ways to collaborate you might not know about. Um, a, a colleague of mine she actually didn't start a tool library in her library, but they started a tool library that they called the electric tool library out of the municipal building works department. And that didn't, and the reason they were able to do it is because their municipal department was actually very concerned about being sued. Because guess what? Government departments have been sued before. So if you're working with a government department that's been sued before, they might be a little concern, more concerned about lending some of these items than you know, a nonprofit who hasn't had that concern. But in this case, they were able to work around all of those concerns by working out of the public works department, which had the right type of insurance. And then the public library managed all the lending, but they didn't manage the actual municipal building. So that was a cool kind of uh, collab. And again, follow up with me. I can get you contacts to these humans. Um, there's all the classic concerns you're probably going to run into. So funding, storage, um, the concept of, well, what if we don't know about uh, tools and these people do. What are we, how are we going to, you know, how are, how's that going to work? And also, how does that play into it? I know at some libraries, there's big concerns about, okay, well, how does, where, how does the hierarchy work then? If you have a person who knows about tools, but doesn't have a library degree and you have a person with a library degree, how is the training going to work? How are you going to get around that? And all of these are overcomable, right? Overcome. Anyway, you can overcome these, but it's just something to, to know about. The biggest concern that surprised me was aesthetics. And I'm going to get more into that when I show you pictures and examples, but I'm going to definitely come back to that. That floored me. I also want to call out, if you don't know what's going on in the U.S. with public libraries, I would highly recommend you take a look at what's happening in your area. And that's just around the world, not just the U.S. Um, but there are places where if they lend the wrong book, actually a librarian could suffer five years of jail now. So there are just a lot of pressing issues. Hunger, poverty all sorts of things that librarians are dealing with on a daily basis. So again, if you get an initial no, try to figure out why. Because if you can help them meet their goals, that could be really powerful for all of you, you know? And they, I guarantee, they want to meet those goals with you. <laughs> um, the other thing, again, at public libraries, you're going to encounter some pretty expert teams. I mean, the catalogers here, wow. Uh, there's some there's some crazy knowledge there, and they're not using tons of it with Library of Things items. But it's really fascinating to see stuff from their perspective and how, well, what if we globalize this and how will that work? You're also going to encounter a ton of enthusiasm and, and excitement. Um, you know, the folks really, uh, there's so many folks who want to work with you and tool libraries and toy libraries and all the libraries you can think of. So I've already gone over this, but I'm just going to say in some... Be ready for this and keep trying. <laughs> so our differences are going to make us stronger overall, right? Once we figure out how to communicate um, and try to, I would say, focus on the, the win-wins. And I'm going to go into how to actually, uh, I would suggest some strategies that have worked out well for some other li tool librarians that I know who have, have crossed, who and, and uh, librarians I know who have crossed this threshold to be like, okay, let's cooperate and do this. So this is the one I wanted to go back to. The one thing I think is really important for you to understand that I didn't realize to the level, and it took me years to understand this one, is aesthetics. Um, be aware that if you do work with a public library, um, there are some of those sticking points I mentioned, but one big one is aesthetics. Um, and this won't be at every public library, but just as an example, I've shown 
many, many public librarians what a tool library can look like, really well, well organized. And I've seen some people start hyperventilating. <laughs> So um, because they're imagining that, a dirty tool on their shelves, right? They're imagining the worst case scenario um, because these are folks who have seen a lot over the years. So I think sometimes it really helps. I have tons of presentations on, on what we finally decided were systems that worked for us. What you see to the left here is like in our basement, everything is labeled in English. We're working on, um, I'm gonna steal some ideas from all of you, some great signage and stuff. Um, everything has its place, everything has an item, everything is checked outable like a book. Um, again, we have amazing staff who has helped us come up with this. I can't tell you, check-in after check-in after check-in of all the clever humans who have better ideas on how to make this happen than me. I had to learn to laminate and use zip ties and use plastic boxes, things I never thought I would do because I'm kind of an eco-freak. <laughs> so worth it but in this case to make it work. Um, we learned how to hang things differently. Uh, there's special hangers you can buy and there's special bars you can get. So we have presentations that we've given to other libraries trying to start libraries of things in order to make this palatable for their work environment. And there's some really good reasons for that. Some libraries are in unions and there's safety and, and other libraries aren't and other libraries have other concerns because they're working more with an aged population. So they need it um, or not even aged. They just know that um, they're not going to be able to read small labels and small print. So there's just so much to learn to work around here. So, but again, this is kind of what a standard, what a standard library of things may look like. Again, the larger items there that you see are hanging in the basement away from the public eye, not because we wouldn't share them, but also because there's kids running around. We do lend most of these items to kids. There's, there's only a few that we don't, but, um, it's also nice not to have the like mini pianos, right? Where everyone can play them all the time because we did that and then we changed it up because there were complaints. <laughs> um, again, there's also some minutia, like if you haven't found silicone bands, if you haven't found um, clear things that people can use their barcode scanners on, these are all the types of things that we had to work on and learn from. So I'm not going to talk about this ad nauseum in this presentation. I just want you to be aware that these are absolutely sticking points um, and that you shouldn't be afraid of them. Be like, we can figure it out together because you can. <laughs> So I think most of us are coming from more of a standpoint on where, why don't we lend everything? Um, which I think some people will be from the public library perspective and others may not. They may not have heard of this. Well, let's lend everything except hate. And let's share everything except for hate and like really dangerous germs. Like So like, let's not share underwear. But yet beyond that, we've got a lot more in the world we can share, right? So that kind of different way of interacting with the world has hit some aspects of public libraries. And then I'd say there's always someone who doesn't know, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. And so I just like to have you all pause again and take a th think about what could a lending ecosystem look like in your community? It's going to look different than yours and mine. For ours, for example, as part of developing our library of things, we also um, were able to help develop this. There was an amazing our um, food insecurity team an emergency food preparation folks, they created an amazing community kitchen in our area. Another folks, um, we were able to make all bus passes free to meet the needs of asylum seekers and things. We were going to lend uh, car uh, bikes and taxi cab rides and things as, at a library, but we actually had to stop that due to COVID. Um, so we, because sharing rides at the time when we didn't know wasn't the best idea. But your library could look really different. So I think it's thinking about what you have. Maybe you have some cool gear rental places. Maybe you have a neat maker space nearby. Maybe you have none of this, but you're like, okay, what do we want to have and what the priorities are? And how does that public library play a role in that? Because I think what it's important to recognize what folks already lend. So maybe you don't have to start there, or maybe you could do something complimentary. So for example, we don't lend any gear at our public library. It's not because we don't think gear is important, but we um, don't want to deal with a few different things. We also don't lend any um, certain instruments, not because we don't think instruments are important, but we didn't want to deal with a few different things. Okay, just checking time. Uh, and these are the things. 
<laughs> so this is a really messy slide, but you get the concept, right? So this is what people immediately go to. And there's very good reasons because have we dealt with it? Some of them haven't dealt with dismemberment yet. Never want to. But <laughs> there's those real issues, okay? I was telling you, you know, spit, we don't want to deal with that. There's great people who rent instruments for this reason. They know how to deal with spit. But we're going to deal with the instruments that don't deal with spit. We don't want to deal with lice. We do deal with lice. We don't want to deal with bed bugs. We do deal with bed bugs. And so we're not going to do hammocks. We're not going to do with anything with helmets. Uh, we have a lot of libraries that are going to have space concerns. Ours did too. But there's a, there's actually specific methods if in the public library. There's called crew. There's like a way that you specifically learn how to get rid of what material at the right time. And so you can actually incorporate things into that policy. Um, and so there's ways to work around established library programs or established library functions that incorporate things as well. And whatever a thing is, maybe a thing is land because you're lending land and in, in, in community garden plots in your community. Maybe a thing are loans. Maybe a thing is art. I don't know. But the point is, is it could be integrated. Um, and so I think it's really interesting for you as a tool library and us as public libraries and us as all these things to think about what exists and how we could lend it. And I want to make sure that I key you into a one key aspect that I think has been underutilized in public libraries, which are something called passes. Right now, a lot of us lend a museum pass. So you'll see that on this calendar. So you can come to many, many, many public libraries around the U.S. at least and in other countries as well and lend um, and say, I'd like to go to the Coastal Botanical Gardens or I'd like to go to the state parks. I'd like to go to this. Well, why couldn't you just go say, I'd like to go to the kayak rental place or I'd like to go to the, the toy library or I'd like to go to the makerspace. So that's an, that is an option that does exist. And yes, some libraries are doing. Um, Okay, so this future is totally possible. And there's so we could, we could, well, I wouldn't be talking for 24 hours, but we could totally talk together about how to make this happen for oodles of time. Um, and I think it just needs to be adaptable to your community members, actors, power, you know, um, types of resources, your values and your priorities. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about that and what your goals are before you approach a public library. Because here are some common ways that we have collaborated. All right. So you can share your programming. I don't know, Buffalo peeps, are you on here? I know, for example, the Tool Library in Buffalo and many others who have presented on this call um, have shared programming with the public library. Uh, I'm just calling you out because uh, I knew you were here, <laughs> so, or at least had been. Um, and that's a great way to do an intro, right? To say, hey, public library, will you give me space? Or will you advertise this program for me? Or will you give me money and I'll put on a program for you and I'll take on the liability? Um, another easy way to collaborate is saying that with repair cafes. So a lot of libraries, they might not have libraries of things or tools, but they'll have repair cafes. And so that's a really easy point. You can ask a library for money because you're providing them with a service. OK, and some libraries do have money, some don't. So in that case, see what the, what they need. They may need quality programming. And so they might be able to give you something like quality advertising to people who don't know about you that you would want as well. Um, or maybe they can give you we've done trades before where someone needed space to have meetings for their board and do a bunch of other things. So we said, OK, you run this program. We'll give you this. OK. Another way is to share your membership. The Denver Public Library and the Denver Tool Library do this. I just checked the other day. There was like a waiting list of like 100 people wanted it. So this is very, very popular, OK? Again, this is cool because the Denver Tool Library is taking the liability for that. But the Denver Public Library is providing that service to those folks who may not have the ability to do that otherwise. Um, and I think it really could be a win-win. Um, and this is something where libraries have museum passes. So this is a known way this exists, okay? There's museum pass software. So this isn't a foreign concept to them. Another way is to increase your space. So the Tacoma uh, Tool Library and the Tacoma Public Library main branch, the Tacoma Tool Library actually operates in the public library main branch at times. They're not right now, but they can. Again, if you're on here, hi. 
Um, and also, I'm so glad we had Iceland on. Yay. Love that example. I think that is a wonderful example. If you're thinking of how to work with your public library and you need to, you want to start in a different way, that's a great example of um, say, okay, well, maybe you don't want to deal with a lot of this. Look at what they did here. Uh, though, if you missed that lecture here, there was a great example of you can, there's a series of cabinets that people could check in and check out of those cabinets um, and get their items. And that cabinet space was often housed um, at a public library. And I've seen similar things where you can actually have those items at trailheads and it's run by the public library. I've seen it where you've had them outside the public library during COVID. People are actually picking up their books, but why can't they pick up something else? But I think, you know, there's just differences of how you want to operationalize that and how you want to work together. So there's my point is here, there's a lot of different models. And the last model I want to call out is you could share your expertise as a tool library, right? You could share your time, you could share your drive, and you could share your expertise and say, okay, all right, public library, here we go. <laughs> so this is what you need to know about some tools. Because we don't all know. I'm the best person at naming tools because I'm like, you know, the thingy that does this. If I was in charge of it all, it would all be called the thingy that. Because I can never remember the gosh darn perfect names. Um, but my point is, is that there's a lot of libraries that have done this over the years. Um, I actually have a series of questions out to the Berkeley Public Library. Jill's going to get back to me. They just took over the, the role of managing that um, branch. But the Oakland Tool Library um, and the Berkeley Tool Library, especially the Berkeley Tool Library, I mean, they've been doing this um, for years. And they have a lot of things that, for example, newbies like my library does not have. Like, we do not share a lot of saws. We share some but not a table saw, not my favorite, you know, miter power saw. Um, and there's very good reasons why. Um, so this is another way that you could actually work kind of with a public library that I think could be beneficial for everyone in the long run if you're clear about kind of what you want and what you want for the communities. All right, check in time. Okay, still have a few minutes. Um, so I just want to do a quick case study call out. Um, again, this is just based on our own, my own experience, because that's, uh, what I got. <laughs> this is our little library. It is a, a small town library. So again, 25,000 folks, right? We, um, are not huge, but, uh, and our lot really evolved. What you see online, we actually just started with a hand, with a, a book of like, you could check these things out because that was the way to get in. Okay. That was the way to get into the system to prove it worked. And um, initially, we um, were focusing our library, um, I do a lot of programming, and our team does a lot of programming, and we focused our, our programming is on sustainability and also on these sustainable development goals. Um, so I've run hundreds of programs now over the years, but some of the initial programs I ran, um, although they certainly fell under the standard definition of what sustainability is, I was also able to... Um, use those programs to um, speak library speak. And um, what we did is we took, but we, uh, to speak library speak, but to address community needs. So this was my, this is our formula. I actually really like math, but these are the formulas I use most often. So, which is the classic, plus is greater than divide, right? So together we can do more than if we divide. But also, so we had community problems, so that's the unhappy face. And then what we did is we addressed those community problems through a sustainability lens, which is the little things. And we, what we did to address them is we worked with community groups who are working on the problem. We provided the resources and the space and we hosted programs to address the community needs. So for example, say we wanted to focus on one of those needs like uh, hunger. I'm not telling you we've solved hunger because that is a complete lie. We haven't. But what we did do is we tackled this problem from multiple angles. And we called out that recognized that food and growing literacy was a missing literacy. So heads up, folks, calling something a literacy can be a real great trick <laughs> to work on it at public libraries. So you can see we call out a different bunch of literacies. And with the um, food literacy, so of course we, we obtain books on these topics. We obtain books on a lot of these topics. Um, but then we also um, uh, 
got things on those topics. So for the, in the food example, for example, if we wanted to work on, um, you know, having no hunger, we actually bought a lot of kitchen tools. We, um, got, uh, we ran a number of different programs, um, uh, multilingual programs. We ran, um, how to cook. We ran how to garden. We gleaned vegetables out of other, uh, out of farms where they weren't being used. We partnered with a ton of agencies. We had snap ed come teach courses, which, um, is a national program. Um, but say people wanted to do a plant-based diet. So we really tried to connect haves and have nots, whether, the have is monetary, whether the have is language, whether the have is friends, whether the have is social connections. And we provided programming um, on that topic. And as part of that programming, we had to get things. So for example, uh, when the mushroom people come by, we got these specialized mushroom log making tools. And if you've ever purchased mushrooms in a grocery store, you know they're quite expensive, especially locally grown, organic, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have these couple hundred dollar tools, you can get locally grown mushrooms that are going to provide you with beautiful mushrooms for five years in your backyard for free uh, for the cost. And in with these specialty tools, you can do that in less than half an hour. Uh, and you can get a log worth of mushrooms again and again and again. Uh, so that was like a real win program. And so we keep trying to do programs like those. Um, and so for here, we really used our programming and our community needs and working with our community to fuel and fund the library of things. Um, and so another way to think about libraries is people are coming to engage with a library or to engage with people or to escape people. And they want to do both of those things when they come to a public library. And tools um, really helped us do that as well, but tools without programs would not have worked for us. We really had to do that in both the same way. So I already kind of talked about the food insecurity example, um, but you can see it, it really went beyond. We tried to really have this holistic um a holistic set of both programs and tools. So we weren't just, we're trying to meet people where they're at. And so this isn't just with food insecurity, right? We've done this with a lot of different needs in our community and we're still doing it. We haven't solved anything. <laughs> There's still lots of problems. If any of you know how to solve them, feel free to, to do that and we'll go on to the next one. <laughs> but um, we also, you know, so this, we, we worked with hospitals to have them screen folks for food insecurity, and then they could come and they get basically get a prescription for free food and free meals. We had, we worked with lists and backpacks and school systems, and we're still doing this. And because of that, you'll notice that if you look at our catalog, our food tools are actually quite robust. Okay. So I'm just, I want to finish up here because I know it's about 10 till, so I want to be um, on, but I just want to let you know that libraries can be really powerful allies to whatever your goals are. And so I would really encourage you to reach out to them and to not be afraid of their weirdo quirks <laughs> because gosh darn it, they have them. Sometimes I was really like, oh my goodness gracious, really? I just want to get the tools to the people, folks, but there's really good reasons for it. And they've got a lot of experience figuring, knowing what those reasons are. So again, I've already mentioned the useful communities. Um, most libraries know about the Sustainable Libraries Initiative. A lot might be interested in joining a lot mutual aid group to talk about the minutia that you may not want to talk about. <laughs> and I think humans like us. So again, thank you so, so much. I hope to work with all of you in the future. And I hope, um, I hope that not all my lies are lies. <laughs> All right, thank you for that. Please do go ahead and uh, as I just put in the chat, if you have any questions for Hazel, please put them in the chat so we can get those asked. I'm gonna come back and showcase the group. And uh, Hazel, do you mind uh, stopping sharing your oh, screen just yes. so we can see everybody? Yes, I would thank much you. prefer that actually, <laughs> to see people's smiling faces. There we are. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. I know there was um, one question which you kind of started to answer a little bit, but I wonder if you can maybe go a little bit uh, deeper into it. Yeah. Um, and that was in relation to um, kind of how some of these passes are currently working or might work yeah. for a for a tool library, right? Because there's you're the the library's doing some vetting, right? But maybe not as much vetting as a tool library might do 
for for membership and kind of how does that responsibility um for the items go do public libraries take on that responsibility for whether an item is returned or not or so yeah can you just talk a little bit about the minutia around yeah. the the passes yeah so we do no vetting i just want to be clear because remember yeah. we have to be free and open to all okay ding 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 so this is where it gets really tricky so um everyone needs to have access to that museum pass or that library pass. So that's where you would have to put in your vetting. Like, okay, maybe it's only over 18 that you allow, right? So you would have to put those restrictions on um, because we, uh, the current, the current, now, uh, Denver is the one, the only one I know of who's had it going for a while um, so that you can check in with them on their more detailed system of exactly how that's working. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't answer to like their, the officials of their contract, but typically with a, a pass like system, you work it out between the library and you. Um, or maybe you sign up if you folks have memberships, like, for example, we have library passes that we give out, like, actually, you get membership to our library for three months and one month. So you can, and they get access to everything, unless we put in there no interlibrary loan for under a month, which makes sense, right? Because it actually takes you three weeks to get that book from across the world. Mm -hmm. Um but, but that is also, I mean, that's still pretty, that can still be a really big deal for some libraries. So you may get pushed back on that as well. Got it. And do you know, have any idea, I mean, one, one thing that came up in an earlier session in relation to, um, let's say, uh, professionals accessing the tool library, right? So someone that's a for-profit company, getting materials from there, um, and that having potential a, a heavier wear and tear there was a question about whether or not there could be or should be different membership tiers, right? Yeah. Um, do you think it, it might work out for a public library to be like an institutional member? So it's not like, all right, there's an annual membership of $50 to access the Asheville Tool Library at a base level. Um, that's the cost for the library membership pass, or is there a place there for a different relationship? Yeah, I think there's a lot to be worked out here. You're going to be trailblazers if you do the pass system. That's why I mentioned it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, so we had, again, um, my tool library hat is like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> there there are ways in which we you could have more institutional members. But from a liability perspective, the public library is not going to want to take on any liability for individual people getting your tools, okay? Mm -hmm. So the, they'll be willing probably to do replacement costs to a certain extent and, and pay that member, so pay a higher membership fee. But I think mm -hmm. folks are more worried about what if they cut off their hand, you know, because they're not trained. Um, and of course yeah. you, I think that's the benefit though there is that you have, okay, well, they can't use this tool until they're trained. Right. And that's the benefit of a past system. So I think there's a lot of potential for what you said to, to charge a public library a higher amount, but to make sure you explain why. Yeah. Got it. Those are some of my initial questions. Any other questions? Anybody want to come off mute or, or throw it in the chat? Hi, this is Kelly. Can you hear me? Hi, Kelly. Yes. Just a, a quick question, I guess. Who do you first reach out to if you're looking to do a partnership with your library? Is there like a staff title or do you go straight to the top or like, how do you recommend just like a cold call or email? Definitely cold call. We get them all day long <laughs> and go to the help desk. It might be called the reference desk. Um, okay. but yeah, absolutely. Cold call. And I would say, ask for three people, um, wow. specifically ask for, so ask for someone, but then say, okay, I'd also love to know. So, cause for many libraries, you'll have something called the library director, but in some of those places, the library director may be like, oh, that's one more thing. I can't. Right. So you need to find your champion. 
And that may not be your director. So it may be the person who runs your programs, which could be very different. Or it may be the person who puts on events who could be very different. Um, and it may be children's programming versus adult programming. And these are, I tell you, because in this world, there are, depending upon your library, they're really siloed. And library people on here, Rachel, feel free to like say, no, it's not like that. <laughs> so, um, but I know it is at some libraries. And you, you need your champion, not necessarily the person in charge. I can uh, attest to the tool library that runs at my public library. So I've been called out. Uh, I am Rachel, I live and work in Little Rock, Arkansas. I've been to almost every single one of these uh, tool library um, shareable. So <laughs> I've been watching um, and I'll say uh, from my own experience here with the tool collection at the public library, it's it's quite different. It's um, Hazel's right, we we will check it out to anyone um, without the training um, and that liability. Um, for us here, we just use a tool library great, uh, waiver and agreement form um, to kind of cover ourselves. Um, at my tool library here at the public library, um, we uh, only check out tools to adults who can consent. Um, so we had the library lawyers check over an addendum and waiver form that that goes on to their library record. Um, we use a, a library cataloging system um, to keep track of all of our tools. Um, <laughs> so our poor catalogers in the book department had to learn how to um, suss apart what a tool is, um, but it's actually quite, um, the software we use is quite um, usable for three-dimensional objects. Um, our tool library was started from within the library. Um, so there is no tool library in central Arkansas where I live. There's no tool shares uh, independent from the library. It's actually a growing collection within public libraries. So I wouldn't be surprised if your community library was interested in starting a library of things. Um, Hazel and I can both attest that like at library conferences um, for the public, um, ALA and PLA, um, Library of Things is like a niche market that people have lots, like library staff have lots of questions and, and they're interested in developing this kind of resource for the communities just to make them as accessible and free as possible. Um, but um, our tool library was started from a bond. So um, one of the managers here before I started, um knew that they were going to go under a major remodel for their branch and tried to throw in the tool library collection to that bond and so it was put to voters in 2015 and they approved it because people love libraries <laughs> or at least they, in 2015 they did um and the my job title came with that collection so they actually advertised for a tool library position, um, but it also came with like library work. So I not only manage a tool library, mending and programs related to the tool library, I also help um, people fax and answer phone calls about books and, and I'm doing it all here. So um, yeah, there, there are public libraries out there I'm interested. Um, so. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Can you go ahead and can you put a link to your library in the chat? Hers is so awesome, folks. You should check it out. It's so different than ours. And that's why I twisted her arm. Thank you, Rachel. I didn't warn her I was going to do that. <laughs> the, and she's hopefully going to do, uh, we're going to try to do a webinar for uh, the Public Library Association together. Also, I'm trying to find this woman who lends amazing chicken incubators from her rural library and is changing the food security system. Anyway, there are great humans out there who want to help you and love what you're doing and they're in the public library world but sometimes it can be a little tricky to find that common like okay how are we going to do this but there are models and there are people doing it so it absolutely can be done and if you need help just please reach out to any of us 
Great. And will you go ahead and actually drop your email okay. in the chat so make that a little easier? Um, it, it is connected to the presentation and the the this presentation um, will be posted, not just the video, but the actual uh, slide deck will be posted to Canvas as well. Um, we are at time, uh, a little bit over time. So I want to make sure we kind of wrap this up. Um, and just want to thank everybody for joining us for this journey, you know, this this last 12 weeks, um, seeing many of your faces on many of these um, sessions. And it's been wonderful to have you all. Um, want to just kind of give a little bit of a quick preview about what's coming next. So as we've mentioned a couple of times, um, we are going to be doing more sessions after this. We're going to take a break for the month of June. And in July, we're going to start up and, and run it monthly. And a number of the sessions that we're talking about doing, some of these things have come out of the collab. You know, we've been doing these polls after a number of this after a number of the, the sessions to determine these. But I think we're going to start in July by focusing on environmental impact tracking. And we're working on the date for that. We're in, and some of what our kind of pre presenters, facilitators will be. Um, other topics that we're looking at are, you know, fix it fairs and how to host those. Um, there's some really wonderful models related to that. Um, <clears throat> community governance came up on a previous session as something that people wanted to learn more about. So um, we're going to make that happen. And then also, you know, how to use my turn potentially and how to use these, these different tools um, to be able to um, manage these uh, libraries of things. And then we also decided we were going to do two fundraising sessions. Um, one focused on um, basically like fundraising events, kind of digital crowdfunding and, and also in-person events. And the other one focused on grants. So how to identify them, how to apply, you know, the whole process, how to kind of track and do the reporting uh, on those grants. And one of the things that we are looking at doing now is kind of instead of just having two sessions on, like I mentioned, for, for fundraising, doing a whole another collab that would overlap with libraries of things on those two, but we're gonna add in additional fundraising sessions as well. And so we're looking at that to happen in the fall. So stay stay up to date on, you know, keep keep up with those things. We're gonna be sending out the, the dates for these um, monthly events as we have them. Hopefully starting within the next few weeks, we should be able to get the first one out for July so you can plan around that. Um, but wait, there's more. So. We're also, as we've mentioned, going to be turning all of these sessions and the resources that were attached to them into a very robust toolkit. Um, we're going to be spending the summer on that. We want to make sure we get it right. There's going to be opportunities for feedback, uh, especially for a lot of the, the folks that are established librarians that have already been doing this. We want to hear from you. We're going to be sending this out as an opportunity to kind of review the drafts of these things, make sure there's stuff that we aren't missing, and there's opportunities to be able to jump in and provide both resources to complement the different sections and also your expertise and direct knowledge into those toolkits as well. So that's another thing we're going to be following up with soon. Uh, Paige, Shareable's communications manager, is going to be leading the development of that toolkit based on all the things that we've already input um, into the collab and the general experience as well. Um, we also are going to be having a... Uh, Solidarity Works is, is our kind of backend program that's managing this collab. We also have our social co-ops um, academy uh, running right now. Previously, we've had our emergency battery networks collab. We've got more collabs in development. Solidarity Works is kind of our general education and organizing arm of Shareable. And we're going to be doing an, a general um, kind of all Solidarity Works open call to go into the program, what these opportunities are to get involved um, coming up in June and I'm seeing that we've got June 25th written down, but I thought maybe we chose a different date for that. So we'll follow up with the exact date and send the information out to everybody, uh, the, in, in, an invitation for that as well. And then finally, um, Liana put this in the chat. She had to jump off last minute. Um, but there is a new tool library Alliance. This is a U.S. based organizing group. Uh, There's been some chat hey, going on. Oh, Josh, you're on here. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm on the road, but I'm happy to speak to it if that's helpful. Yeah, just yeah, just real quick. Yeah, so uh, I'm Josh Epstein with the Northeast Seattle and Shoreline Tool Library. Work with Liana at Station North and uh, a bunch of other tool libraries. And we have started a National Tool Library Alliance 
Um, right now it is just for folks that have been a little more established for two years, but we're working really hard with Tom and crew to figure out how that bigger group can, uh, more established group can help with the toolkit and folks just getting into the game. So if you're interested in it, feel free to email me at josh at seattlereconomy.org. Yep, and Josh, you're driving, so maybe you don't see the chat, but there's been um, the the link. Uh, Liana put the link to the very rough, basic uh, website for the Tool Library Alliance, which includes a uh, a form to be able to uh, request to join the alliance. And currently, the alliance has monthly sessions as well. Um, I would refer to them more as like, rather than these kind of one on one sessions that we've been doing, they're more like two or two o two roundtables, and as uh, Josh mentioned, I think maybe Leon actually put it in the chat that, um, we are kind of a number of the sessions we're going to be running for the rest of the year and potentially moving forward after that are following on the heels of the tool library Alliance sessions where there's resources being developed in there, that stuff is being refined. So a great example of that was the kind of workshops and classes session that we had, um, I don't know, just last week, right. Um, that one was coming on the heels of a kind of 202 session that was hosted for the Tool Library Alliance uh, a couple of months ago. So we're we're working in concert together. And as was mentioned, Shareable is working to support the larger develop, development of this Tool Library Alliance as well. So there's going to be more opportunities to in, engage with that as we move forward. That was a lot. That was a big mouthful. The last 12 weeks has been a lot we're definitely still processing this as an organization at Shareable. And I think uh, with all of you as well, I'm seeing I'm probably missing chats coming through. Um, but want to just, again, thank everybody for for joining us with this collab. You know, we really are still piloting our Solidarity Works program. Um, we're in the, in, you know, about a year or two into a major shift for Shareable as an organization where we're moving from, from really focusing on kind of the inspirational side of things to the action and and supporting groups to actually take the things that we've published and that we're continuing to publishing about and enact them in their own communities to adapt and to to replicate models that are working. So thank you all for joining us as we continue to develop this program. I know some things have been a little clunky as we've gone, and that's just because we're fresh. And appreciate everyone sticking with us through this. Um, and hopefully we get to talk a little bit more uh, with all of you about what we have planned for Solidarity Works moving forward and ways to get involved in that uh, when we're coming up in that session in June. And I think with that, we're going to close. Um, and again, this is just a pause really more than an end. And anybody who wants to stick around for you know the next 15, 20 minutes, we're going to stick, we're going to stay on here. If you want to chat, if you've got additional feedback for us about these sessions, we really appreciate it. Um, I know that Candice, maybe you might want to post it again, but earlier in the chat posted the link to our survey for this session um, for feedback on this. We've Again, we've been collecting all this feedback as we've gone. If you've got additional feedback just about the collab as, as, as a whole, please let us know. Um, you can reach out to Candice and you can reach out to me. Um, I try to be as responsive as possible, but I also have about a hundred unread emails in my inbox right now. So if I'm a little slow, please bear with me. I do try to get back to everybody, even if it takes me a little bit of time. Um, so just, yeah, thank you all. Yeah, perfection. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. Whew. Yeah, thank you all. Thanks, folks. It's been great. Looking forward to the next chapter. Yeah, appreciate you joining us for uh, almost every single session. Every session have you been on, Claire? Um, I'm still yet to watch the communications one, which is ironic because I'm a graphic designer. So. <laughs> I don't know how I managed to miss that one, but um, I was watching it. Um, so yeah, sounds like there's loads of exciting coming stuff coming up as well. So I will definitely be staying in the loop. Yeah, Thank excellent. you guys. Yeah, yeah, you and Joy and Francesca and Steve, you've been on almost every single one too. 
but uh and and Francois, uh or am I saying your name right? Francois. Yes, thank you. You've been joining us for a lot of these sessions as well. So appreciate you sticking sticking around through through this process. Yeah, and I'm learning a lot. Yeah. So has Lynn Ford. I've been keeping up with her. She's been yep. on a lot of our calls. So thank you all so much. Yeah, a lot of a lot of Washington. <laughs> a lot of Washington. Uh, you know, Station North. Minnesota. Yeah. Portland. So I have both Portlands. I've missed uh, some of the sessions, but I'm wondering. Has there been a discussion of how to integrate the uh, just the whole library of things, and especially as it relates to reuse and um, what do they call them, repair cafes and things mm -hmm. like that, in with some of the uh, zero waste strategies and 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 um, just climate action plans? Because I'm working with the people in Minnesota on that, and it would seem that they in, are increasingly have dollars or budgets and things to do things. And it would seem that supporting a thriving reuse economy that has a library of things at the center of it would make a lot of sense for them. And I just don't know if that's been successfully um, put packaged together so that we don't have to reinvent telling those stories. You're smiling, Hazel. <laughs> well, Cami, Cami raised first. I think they have okay. some stories. Um, that's we're trying to do that across Washington. Actually, um, there are a few projects that are pretty, so, some very in in their embryonic stage, and some more advanced that are combining um, reuse, repair, tool library, and other community services all under sort of one roof. Um, we're actually working on trying to build the infrastructure between the networks to to make them more robust. Uh, Josh, Josh is definitely one of the the sort of Seattle based, along with Amanda from South King Tool Library, um, working on some some things there. But then we've got more of the the rural spaces who we're we're trying to figure out how to do like hub and spoke mm -hmm. models. Um, okay. Metal Power Cycles, who hasn't been on this call, but they have an integrated model of a remake center, which is kind of like a take it or leave it, along with repair um, events and tool libraries. So yes, and I used to I used to be under Zero Waste Washington, so it's it's all in these same conversations. It's it's all nice big grab bag. Everybody yes. Talks to everybody. So in parts inspired by Tom and uh, the whole shareable movement, and in part trying to figure out a better business model, our company, which works on large scale strategy implementation, is looking at migrating into making what we do free. And we, so we have, uh, a, among other things, we have a technology platform for large scale strategy implementation. And one of the areas that we're working on is implementing, in as an example in Minnesota, their state client action framework and the Minnesota climate equity framework and the Hennepin County zero waste plan and the Minneapolis waste reduction plan and the neighbor, the green zones and all of these overlapping things. And I put a link in there to a 13 minute video that shows how these put to fit together. And it actually is focusing on zero waste and waste reduction as an example that I use in that 13 minute video. But what we're what we're now looking at doing is teaming up with large nonprofits and philanthropic organizations to say, let's make this available to anybody in, you know, in the world. We haven't figured out the exact pathway to get there because we've got millions of dollars we've invested in it. And um, but I think working with shareable could be part of it and yep. taking the templates of how do you take, you know, how many communities are doing climate action plans and they're just, they're reinventing the wheel. They don't have a way of managing it. They, it's just a tragic missed opportunity to work more collaboratively and sharing. And um, it's something that I think could really take off. And uh, Washington is one of the states where we could do that. And, and we think that we have foundation, I'm sorry about the dogs barking, that we have 
<laughs> foundations that are would be willing to pay for it. But they've yeah. said we don't want to just, you know, I feel like we're pushing software on people or pushing an approach. But I think it makes a ton of sense. And this group is one that could help get it out there, especially those that are working with the reuse and such. Yeah. I mean, and I think I was gonna, I was go gonna ahead. say, and I, I think Jason can speak to this a little more as well. But like in Portland, you know, there is the uh, resourceful PDX, which has kind of worked to be a bit of a hub for that, right? And we did a we did a, a full kind of feature story on the like overall circular economy space in in the city of Portland, Oregon. Um, a couple of years ago, which I just put in the chat as well. Yeah, Resourceful PDX is kind of a helpful hub. It's actually maintained by Metro, by our Metro Waste company. Um, yeah. So that helps that they have a consistent uh, resource streaming, um, funding, and so on and so forth. Um, but there's always room for improvement and collaboration for sure. They just recently reached out to us to update some of that information. Um, so staying connected super important i'd say here it's happening in a kind of a small town way without the tech uh, and i say that with no problems with tech i background there but um i'd say like for example you asked like all of our tools are we had the repair cafe so that all of our tools from the library will get repaired at the repair cafe. If they can't be repaired, then they we dispose of them appropriately with the sustainability committees, with the reuse. We work, we do tons of zero waste programming. We work uh, with our committees. We're part of the Sustainable Libraries Initiative, which is nationally sharing all of those resources as we get to do that. So I think that might be a, an avenue in. So it's, it's holistically connecting that, making sure that's done also in an equitable way so that you know, when you're either acquiring the thing, you know, everyone has and getting rid of the thing. It's not just the burden isn't on a certain type. And I'm not saying we're winning right. because, look, I'm on a computer right now that's yeah was not manufactured locally, but, um, <laughs> you know, and certainly has some other troubles there. But we're definitely thinking about that all. Um, and we, you know, I fix it gave us a huge donation for the library of things for that purpose, you know. So it's definitely part of it's strategic. Yeah. We came from it at a values perspective first for the sustainable development values, which I, again, I'd like to use as the lowest common denominator, right? right? right. Like it's yeah. not that we shouldn't be going for other values. <laughs> right. But we also haven't met those yet. Yeah, least common denominators aren't a bad place to start. They're a bad place to stop, <laughs> but they're, they're, yeah. And there's so much more that can be done. And um, we've been, building all of these networks of people like shareable and others that are working on these. But re the reality is, is we haven't figured out a sustainable business model, even though we've the IBM center for the business of government said our software was, they had a report that said our software was the best and most powerful for large scale system change and social transformation. And we're, we're a small social entrepreneurial company. So we're just trying to get it out there to have the most impact. And now that we've got some potentially large foundations, large nonprofit type organizations doing in, in the space of um, public interest technology that are saying, you know, what, can, how can we use technology that's not trying to just maximize money for Silicon Valley investors, but that's actually trying to help solve big complex issues. And we, I feel like we're getting closer, but what we need is a bunch of people and organizations to say, we want to pilot this and, you know, being able to then say, okay, you know, the McKnight Foundation and working with the Milken Institute and others, we have people that want to do this. We're willing to start on this transition to potentially and eventually even being fully open source, but we have to survive some that transition and we think the initial way is just going to be foundations saying, sure, if people use it, we'll pay for it. And then working on, and one of the key examples is the zero waste um, circular economy sorts of things 
And if there's a bunch of people who are like, yeah, we want to help this transition of this, these tools and techniques into that shareable space, let's get a Zoom call, let's put together, you know, what, who's working in which communities and what would it take to get some of the things going? Because those pilots, I think, will um, blaze the trail for some pretty powerful expansion globally. Because we're talking with, I mean, we have connections with, you know, how the United Nations might be using something like this for food system change in many different countries, or some of the huge things around climate action, but we just haven't quite figured out the path to get there. Yeah, we've been talking in the in the Two Library Alliance um, quite a bit about, you know, if we were going to seek collective funding, what are those goals? Um, and so that's something we're, we're pushing towards developing, you know, having more concentrated conversation on what can we do? What are the, the greatest benefits um, to the, you know, the collective? Mm -hmm. But I think also to Hazel's point earlier, and I'm sure everyone at Shareable can recognize this too, like, um, if we try and do trying to do things at scale with the uniform approach can be really difficult because you've got, especially with repair and reuse, you're looking at all these different waste stream systems, all these different waste haulers, all these different equipments they have in different places. Um, I think whenever we can scale things, that's great. I think having these venues for open conversation to discuss what's working for who being able to ask questions and get different answers um, to solve the same problem in different places is super, super helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully we can get some conversations going in here with some of the, the things that I'll send out to Tom and figure out how to share. I've got a few of the emails here uh, mm -hmm. of some of you. I'll put my email address in here. Um, yeah, I'm Cammie. Uh, I think in tandem to what Bill and Jason were just mentioning, um, some conversations that I've I've had, of course, with the Washington folks, not all of the Washington folks, sort of some of our like longstanding key members that we're trying to figure out, um, impact calculation. Uh, I know my turn has some some ability to do this, but we're we're trying to look at a model that is, good and agile enough to accommodate repair groups, reuse, um, sharing. And we're talking with New York because they have this like really beautiful, robust model that maybe we're going to implement statewide if we can get the support from it so that everybody has access to it. But my understanding was that it had been developed initially to eventually be publicly available and then, you know, things changed. So that's something that's going on in the background. Um, oh, and I just lost my other train of thought. Anyway, we're um, common. Oh, I was talking with Leanna about um, how can this network do common research? Because I feel like we all have to like, go dig for the pieces of data and the studies that demonstrate such and such that are kind of what we need, but not exactly what we need because they were done somewhere else or they were done with a different lens. And how could we possibly move forward um, research at at a level that meets many of, of the needs to you know, basically make the case for what we're doing, et cetera, and just like find new insights. I mean, that's where having like, a a dynamic repository becomes really important, right? Like that's one of the things that we've been, <clears throat> like I think that the toolkit we're going to plan on developing is is good. It's a first step and it needs to be a living document also. So how do you kind of balance those things like having a quote unquote finished product then you can share out, but also a way to, to continue to build upon it in an organic and collaborative way. Um, and so we're still thinking about that too. Mm -hmm. That's I, that's absolutely something that I've I've been well I we we've been discussing in in the Washington network and and in the repair economy network. There are all these great resources that people are like oh go here go here but unless you know where to go and you have that sort of in with somebody who has the insight, 
you can go down so many rabbit holes. Um, yep. And it's just, it doesn't seem efficient. Not that there has to be one, one place that all of this information is held necessarily, but could there be returns to scale if we align? One of the other areas that I put the link in the chat is with youth mental health and youth well-being. Um, many communities, that's a huge issue coming out of the pandemic. And where we've built in library of things is with just communities really developing positive youth engagement and positive youth recreation and uh, being able to create opportunities, whether it's you know, disc golf or, you know, snowshoes in the winter or just all different ways of being able to check out things and then wrapping around different community groups that might, whether it's board games or other things that just that lower income communities often just don't have the luxury of some of the not super expensive things that could create positive youth engagement, especially whether it's outdoors or different sorts of things. And um, yeah, it's just, it's an area where we're trying to introduce libraries of things. And it might be a small step to say the public library can check out board games and there can be different groups where they're, they're learning mental health first aid. They're being trained as mental health allies. And then, you know, you might have college students or whatever that are helping struggling high school students who are lonely and disconnected get into you know, board game nights at the, that they might do at the library or at a cafe or something, or young adults getting together in different ways. And then looking at some of the, you know, is there outdoor recreation things that people can check out, which might be just a little step for a public library to make that's not as daunting as, you know, we're going to be renting chainsaws and, you know, things that people might cut off their arm, their limbs with. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about instruments, having different instruments, instrument making, mm -hmm. things like that, um, and doing some repair cafe work that's more youth oriented, where it's like, okay, come in, take a thing apart, see how it works. Maybe it gets back together. Maybe it was already hopeless. And I think it, including social workers and folks who have that pre-certification and, and that inclination to really work with uh, that specific like that subset uh, is would be a really big benefit to any of that kind of programming. All right. Well, I've got to jump off here, but uh, nice yep. connecting with you. Appreciate everybody's good work in this area. Thanks, Tom. And yep. uh, we'll be in touch about uh, next steps. All right. Thank you all. Any any other last last thoughts before we? Close for now. Yeah. Bye, Joy. Thanks, everybody. Yep. See you next time. Bye, yeah. Hey, Cammy. Actually, real quick. Um. So repair, repair, fix it fair, repair session. Mm -hmm. Um. You think August or September? One of those would be. Yeah, that would be more doable. I did. Um. I did put in the chat that. Uh. I think. I, I'm more than happy to help coordinate it and can be there as a voice, but I don't think that I should be the voice mm -hmm. leading it. So I'm I'm not doing repair events myself on a regular basis. Yep. And so many others are that they're seeing, you know, so the ins and outs and how things are changing, what um, what are some of the nuances of their particular situation. I would like to put those voices forward. Mm -hmm. for sure.